Life Audio. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We want families to come here and gain insightful strategies that empower them to successfully teach diverse learners at home. Hosted by founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, Peggy Ployer. Our goal is that these powerful weekly conversations will boost your confidence to cultivate the best at-home learning environment for your student. For more homeschool resources, go to spedhomeschool.com. You're listening to Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. We'll start the conversation with Peggy and her guests next. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Hello, hello, Quinice Petway here, co-host of the Your Daily Bible Verse podcast. Are you someone who loves to take a deep dive into God's Word, one verse at a time to explore His will for your life, and desire to draw closer to Him? If that sounds like you, I'd love to invite you to head over to lifeaudio.com and search Your Daily Bible Verse to tune in and subscribe for daily inspiration, life application, and spiritual transformation through the in-depth exploration of God's Word. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool, a nonprofit that empowers families to home educate diverse learners. To learn more, visit spedhomeschool.com. Here's Peggy Ployer. Today we're going to learn how to teach a whole child so you can provide a well-rounded education for your students and not feel like you're you're skipping out or missing out on something or um, or focusing on something too much. And um, my guest today is Veronica Flores. Welcome, Veronica. And thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm, a, I'm very excited to be here. Yes, yes. I, I loved this topic when you brought it up. This month, we're focusing on twice exceptional students. And I was telling Veronica ahead of time, I've got some of those students. And my tendency when I had these students was either to focus on on what they were not doing well or focusing too much on what they did well. And I think this is a very important topic to address is that whole child learning and really how to schedule that. And and Veronica has got some great resources and some great tips um, for you on on how to do that. And so I'm excited for her to to share um, this hour with us. And if you're popping on, we just want you to know that you can be part of this conversation. Um, It looks like Facebook, again, is not allowing us to broadcast live. So that's going to have to go up um, after the recording. But um, but if you are watching on YouTube, make sure you, you put your comments, your questions in the feed. We would love for you to be part of this conversation. And um, and so, Veronica, as we're getting um, started, I would just love our audience um, to know a little bit about you, um, mm-hmm. what, you know, whatever you um, want to share with us about your homeschooling journey, how that started, and just kind of uh, a little bit about you and your family. Okay, so I'm an unlikely homeschooler. I used to joke around that I was the worst possible candidate for homeschool mom. (laughs) I was a public school educator. I was very um, 
public school minded, if you will. I didn't even know that homeschooling was a thing until uh. <laughs> our neighbor two houses down told us, yeah, we homeschool. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> so <laughs> the Lord knew that I needed that neighbor at that time because oh. I had no clue. And so when the time came for my son to go into kindergarten, that little seed was planted of wow. maybe there's a different way to do things. Right. And so we decided at that time to, to try it for a year because we figured if things didn't go very well, then we could just repeat kindergarten and we'd be just fine with the school right. system. But um, thing, one thing just led to another. The Lord just led us in this journey. And now I have an eighth grader, almost a high schooler, a wow. fifth grader and a second grader that I'm homeschooling. So it's been quite the journey, but I couldn't imagine it any other way. We we love homeschooling and just all the opportunities that it allows us um, to embrace and discipleship and family time together and learning and growing all of us through this process. So it's been a good yes. journey. How that seed has grown. I, I love how mm -hmm. you talk about seed. Veronica and I were talking about ahead of the conversation. We were talking about how she's her and her family planted a garden and they're getting ready to plant it outside from seeds. And what an amazing picture that is of just one person mentioning something and mm -hmm. growing into this into your family. Um, that That is just so cool. And I think oftentimes we don't think of, you know, our homeschooling journeys as planting seeds for other people, but, mm -hmm. but they can so much. And so if you feel like that nudge to say to your neighbor or to a friend, you know, I homeschool and, you know, have you ever thought about it? Um, that's, I just, I just feel like I should share that and um, encourage you guys to, to, to share it with others. I know a lot of people tried it during COVID, but it wasn't really homeschooling. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> so, so yeah. So as we're kind of moving into this topic, um, why is it something that you are, are passionate about and focusing on that, that whole child learning? I think for the longest time going into this journey, I had that, mindset of standardization for so long. That was what my job was. I was a right, consultant. A uh -huh. And then as a consultant, I went around, you know, getting those test scores up, getting those test scores up. And you have yes. to be here by this point. And everything was so standardized. So when I started homeschooling, I brought that system with me for a year. Yes. And I'm sure everyone else can start <laughs> laughing now, right about now. But um, I had no clue at the time that right. things could look differently. And in many cases, things have to look differently. Exactly. And um, when I tried to fit my son into that mold and he decided to break through that mold, I realized that I had to rethink things and I had to really look at things again and <clears throat> start questioning what I understood education to be, start questioning Absolutely. what I believed was most important and what my child or my children needed to learn. And so in many ways, it just, it was a huge paradigm shift because I had to unlearn so much and relearn. And, um, but going through that process was so eye opening as well. And to get to that place of seeing what is most important and working toward those things and finding that peace in there, I just felt that heart for wanting to share with others, like there's a better way. There's another way to right. do this. Yeah. You can find freedom in your homeschool and still, you know, with freedom comes responsibility and still meet that responsibility. But to Absolutely. walk in that freedom and joy is so important for our kids and for our families and, and homeschools overall. Absolutely. You know, you talked about establishing what's most important. Um, how did you go about that process um, for your own family? I think at first, what was most important was checking off the boxes. <laughs> and it was, you know, we got this curriculum and we have to get through this because it said we're supposed to finish it by here because level two is coming up in September. Right. So when we were trying that and it was stressful and I realized, okay, this, this is not working and this is yes. not good for any of us. <laughs> um, I realized that I just had to take a step back. And that's where prayer was so important for our journey oh, of yeah. just asking the Lord, what does this need to look like? And and peeling back those layers of what society was saying needed to happen and trusting yes. that what he says is most important is what needs to happen. 
And so yeah. we started off with just building those relationships and discipling the children and, and then taking that time to actually establish that vision for our homeschool because, you know, we were working toward a vision, but it wasn't ours. It was someone else's vision exactly. for what homeschool should look like. And maybe that was a great vision for that company and many, many children, but it wasn't a good fit for our family. And so we had to be able to take the parts that we liked and what worked and then be able to also let the Lord lead us in our journey with our uniqueness and our differences and everything else um, in order to move forward from there. So it was it was a painful process. (laughs) I'm sure. Yes. Because a lot of that comes fear and fear starts creeping in and saying you're not doing enough. You're missing out over here. Your kids are going to be behind. You're not focusing on what they're focusing on next door or across the street and um, navigating that was is just it was such a faith journey it is such a faith journey as I was mentioning to you earlier you know I thought I dealt with all that then and now that my son's going into high school that fear is knocking on the door again yes so um it's being able to walk in that faith and um, and establishing that vision that we know is most important and that we're going to trust God with results at the end of it as long as we're walking faithfully each day. Yeah, yeah. So much more important than I know so many parents say, well, I just get the list of, you know, what your child needs to know in first grade and, you know, <laughs> or what they need to go know in second, you know, and they just keep going on there. But again, like, I think it was very important how you pointed this out was that that is somebody else's priorities. It is not God's priority for that child, for your family. And when you hand over that responsibility to those lists, you aren't truly being obedient into the mm-hmm. calling of homeschooling that you've been given. Mm-hmm. Um, so important to to have that that whole centered focus and 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 really, it's not just the child; it's the family, as you you were you're talking about. I think we often forget that mm-hmm. is that you know we we have multiple kids and each of them were given to us. <laughs> um, and, and it isn't a mistake that, that they are working on different things. I found that as I was working with one child, you know, things between the two children ended up being maybe a larger focus than what was in the books. Um, but just getting along was, you know, the priority of the day. Um, yes. And how much more important that is, as you know, especially as now I have adult children and seeing <laughs> those were really good priorities to focus on. (laughs) Yes. And it goes back to that whole child focus of we can get lost in thinking, you know, we're just going to gloss over that so we can check off those boxes in this curriculum over here and not seeing the importance of, we're growing adults, we're growing people and Absolutely. teaching them how to handle those situations and how to work through those situations and how to handle those big emotions is just as important um, as some of the other things that they're learning as well, because this learning will not be effective without those other skills, those relational skills Absolutely. and so forth. So yeah. it all together. Mm-hmm. After a word from our sponsor, we'll dive back into this conversation. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Hey everybody, I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. And we're hosts of the Kainos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. The word kainos means new, and that's exactly what we want to do on our podcast. Bring something new from what is old in our faith. And on this show, you might hear us explore topics like what the Bible has to say about student loan forgiveness, 
discuss how the satanic temple affects our view of religious liberty in America, or even question why is it that so many people are having rapture anxiety. To learn more about the podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool. Go to spedhomeschool.com to get resources and support for teaching your unique learner at home. So did you have a, a systematic way of setting goals specifically for yourself or for your kids? I did. I created a system mainly because my personality and because of everything I did before was very, um, I wanted to know where I was headed. Right. And I think for the longest time, you know, when you buy a curriculum, you're trusting them to know where you're headed. And so because of that, you have to hold on tightly to it because if you miss it, there are going to be gaps. If you switch, you're going to have gaps because they already mapped it out their way and someone else mapped it out a different way. Right. And so I started struggling with that at first because um, I had done curriculum writing in, in the public school system and everything was start with the end in mind. And so that was the first thing that I challenged myself to do was what is my end? Where do I hope Good. to be yes. at the end of this? What do I want our children to think or say about our homeschool journey? What do I want them to right. say about me as their teacher uh-huh. and mother? <laughs> you know, how do I want them to remember these days? And so yeah. sitting down with some of those questions help me to reflect and really kind of see that bigger picture and not just the, let's just get through this day. Right. <laughs> um, Even though some that. days are probably like that, yes. but yes, <laughs> but we're working towards something bigger and greater. Yes. And that kind of helps, you know, that journey mm-hmm. and that process. So I started jotting down those questions that I was reflecting on and um, to create that vision for our homeschool. And then I started looking at that bigger picture. And so I started breaking it down by topics like discipleship or science and, you know, school subjects in many ways, but also things like life skills and um, other things that I thought were just as important. And so I called it a bucket planner because I saw it like a big giant bucket list of all the things that I wanted to accomplish with the kids over the course of those 12 years or 13 years or whatever it is. Um, and so I think that really helped me too in seeing that I don't have to do it all today. And <laughs> I don't yeah. have to do it all oh, this year. So mm-hmm. We have time to grow and to shift through these things and to learn these things. And really so much of it repeats itself anyway. And so yeah. much of it um, doesn't have to be done in the younger years. We have that time in the, in the older. So it's kind of, it helps to prioritize that so that there isn't that self-imposed pressure all the time to do it all now. Right. So yeah, that's what that idea of a bucket and (laughs) and just dropping things in and, you know, filling that bucket up over time. And because, yeah, we sometimes somehow think that there's there's going to be we can pave the way and make a path, you know, in the the exact same right direction that everything's going to happen. And it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. But but we can like drop things in. Um, And so that that's a much better. Uh, much more freeing picture, I think, to to embrace versus, you know, having that that certain, like, we do this first and the second and this third. Um, and there are some educational things that we have to build those foundations mm-hmm. on. And um, so we're not talking about that. But but overall, like you said, we repeat a lot. And, um, and we're going to reach those goals over time. And even as adults, I, you know, we have things that, that we struggle with that we're still working on Mm -hmm. (laughs) and our kids will have those same things too. And so even though you think you may have accomplished something, you'll see it crop up again. (laughs) And and then you can't say, well, I checked that off the list that should be done. (laughs) (laughs) Instead, we're still working on that. So, So yeah, some really good points. Um, about about goal setting. And I know you have um, a free resource for our viewers too with that that bucket planning system. And that link will be in the YouTube description. Great. Uh, yes, I do yes. have a free printable library. So in there, there's um, it starts off with a mom bucket planner. That one's the free one that they can just kind of go through that process of reflection on 
you know, when we start homeschooling, we want to jump to the school part, but really establishing the home part first. And yes. it begins with us as parents, you know, abiding in the Lord and our relationship with the Lord and getting yeah. our strength from him. And then it goes into our home and those rhythms that need to be in place, because if we don't have those rhythms in place, we can't do the school part over here. Right. And so it kind of just gives you that, um, that breakdown of setting all the pieces in order to get to the schooling part. And um, that'll hopefully set them up for success. So that's in there along with just a number of other printables that I've created along the way for our kids and so forth. So. Very cool. Yes. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll share more about Veronica's site and, Mm -hmm. and all the things that she has available um, as we're kind of going through and then towards the end too. Um, So, you know, a lot of what you've been talking about is that um, learning isn't just something that curriculum dictates. Can you talk a little bit more about using curriculum as a tool instead of that overarching dictator of your school? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think for me, an aha for me was with our son at the time. He was about five or six years old, and he was into... Um, that little char- character from Up, the Wilderness Explorer. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And he just loved this little character, and he made his backpack to look exactly like it. He cut up a shirt out of yellow fabric and made a shirt. He made a sash. He made badges. He made a guidebook. I mean, he just went wow. all out into this. <laughs> And I have this memory, I, I kind of jumped into it a little bit, but I was like, we got to get back to our curriculum. And at that time, we were studying something totally different in science. And so I remember saying things like, put that away, we got to get back to our school. Let's stop doing this. We got to do this over here, because we're going to run out of time, we're going to fall behind. Right. And it took me a while to recognize I missed that opportunity right there. I missed that Uh chance to just dive in and say, you know what, let's study this now. Let's go on hiking trails. Let's go look at, you know, all of God's creation out there. You know, we can explore this. We have the freedom to do that. And it's not to say that the curriculum is bad. There's some great ideas in there. But I had to learn to use those as tools. Like, what do I like from there that supports our goals, not let me down my goals to accomplish what they're telling me I have to do when they say I have to do it. And so that was a huge part of our shift is when we established those goals and we said, you know, nature study is one of our goals. Then we had that freedom to use a curriculum or to go out in nature and explore for ourselves. We could use field guides. We could use um, just local resources in the area where we have different, um, the parks where they do the, the park rangers, they do those classes and things yes. like that. Uh-huh. And we could explore that and we could watch videos. And so there was a number of different ways that we, I was afraid to try because I was doing exactly what was being told to me here. Right. And that was what, that was one of my strongest messages. And just trying to get others to see, you can use it as a tool, you know, use it yeah. as a means to accomplish your goals and walk in that freedom and really just explore all the learning opportunities that are out there and that best meet the needs of your kids too, and how they learn and how they take right. information. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And how good to embrace those those really passionate interests of your kids Mm -hmm. because then they, they just think you're playing along. It's not school. (laughs) It's kind of like tricking them into it. (laughs) Now if I try to dress them up like a wilderness. (laughs) So it's just capitalizing on those opportunities as they arise. And I can give a few more examples along the way as I was slowly letting go of that, you know, I need to do this. Um, But yeah, there's so many kids are just naturally curious and they just want to learn and grow. And, you know, just being open to that is important. Absolutely. Yes. And it it does. It takes in us that willingness to be playful, um, Mm -hmm. to be responsive to to them instead of just that that dictator of curriculum, which is kind of how this conversation started. (laughs) Um, And and, you know, and to just explore and learn alongside them instead of saying, well, this, this is a resource that has all the answers. 
And mm. instead, let's go find the answers. And, and, and really in the long run, what we're creating is we're creating kids who know how to learn. Yes. They don't absolutely. just know how to ingest information and spit it back out. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you, you hear parents all the time say, I want to create a lifelong learner. Well, Veronica just told you how. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but it, it takes us getting outside of our box to, um, to really start that, that process and, um, yes. and, and to explore with our children and learn. So, mm -hmm. but, um, and it's a lot of that example. unlearning too, because we were taught yeah. that the experts know everything and mm. we were taught to sit and get and regurgitate that back for a lot of us. And yes. so, um, it is hard to kind of step away from that and say there are all these other ways to learn that may look nothing like school, but yeah. it's learning and it's growing and it's education and um, being able to step out of that box, like you said, is so important at times for our kids. Yeah. So it, it took me a long time and I'm still learning, you know, I'm just realizing mm -hmm. as I'm studying a lot about just trauma based childhood mm -hmm. experiences too. And that ability to play is very triggered to that mm -hmm. um, and explore. So if, I mean, so just a caveat, if you have adopted children who are having a really hard time with this, um, that that is based in their trauma too. And so mm -hmm. there's just so much intertwined in, in all of that. And, um, and often we, we, we can beat ourselves up because, you know, either we didn't do it when our kids were little, I can, mm -hmm. I can think about that right now, <laughs> or I can say, you know what, just that's, you know, we, we learned along the way together yes. and by God's grace, we ended on a good note. <laughs> Yes. And, and so, you know, just wherever you are in your homeschool journey, just know that you're hearing this information when you needed to hear it and that you can make changes and, um, and those changes will be impactful wherever your student is at. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know, we, we talk a lot about on this program because specifically we focus on diverse learning needs. Um, how would, you know, focusing on that whole child for diverse learners be all the more important? And then what, what suggestions do you have for parents who have those kids that are really outside the box? <laughs> Okay, so go back to that first question, because I heard both at the same time. Okay, so, um, so why is it so important for us to focus on that whole child um, education for a child, especially that has those, those learning struggles or is twice exceptional, you know, they have that giftedness and yet the glitchiness too with the, that learning? I think it's just meeting them where they are to help them grow. When a child is in that frustration zone, when a child is in a stress or that fight or flight mode, learning yeah. cannot take place. Absolutely. And you can push all you want and you can dump all the workbooks in, on their lap that you want and it's just not going to happen. Or they might memorize it for a test and delete it right after because there's yes. that state of... Um, fear, or like you said, in some cases, trauma that they can't work past. And so we have to be able to create that safe environment for them to yeah. learn and to thrive in. And part of that is being flexible and being open to new ways of learning and seeing things and, um, and cultivating their specific needs and, and, abilities and interests and so forth. And so going back to like that bucket planning system, you know, going into, something like science, what does that need to look like and for that child? Um, what are some of their interests right. in dumping those in that bucket? And then what about reading? Is this an area where they need a little bit more phonics instruction or tutoring? Or what are some things, some games that they can play, some videos that they can watch? And so you dump those in that bucket. And so you're taking that child and you're helping them grow with their strengths and abilities versus coming in Got with... It the best curriculum out there. Does that make sense? Yes, and yes. so uh -huh. you're going child by child, establishing those goals and growing them. Like you said, the whole child, it's not just the academic portion, but it's also the life skills. And maybe that child needs to learn time management or that child needs to learn how to organize their materials. And so that becomes a part of your curriculum. That becomes a part of your goals and your homeschool right. day in teaching them those skills that they're going to need as adults. And as they continue to move forward as students, so. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it's kind mm-hmm. of like that eclectic approach that a lot of homeschoolers have, but on an individualized child basis. I've never heard of that before, mm-hmm. but it makes so much sense if you you set those goals with that eclectic approach kind of individually versus saying this is how we're going to, you know, address everybody's needs in this area, (laughs) which really you can't. Um, And I found out as, you know, my kids were getting older too, and I was able to focus more one-on-one with them that, that I could do more of that approach, or at least I got my brain into that, that mode a little better. Um, But but that is so important even when they're younger too is is that yes they're going to need maybe a tutor here or uh, a different um you know, like you said videos you, all these different things that you know we we kind of batch into to their education but um to individualize it as well that um and being okay advice. to get that tutoring service or being okay to get that help. I think sometimes as homeschoolers, we want to do it all on our own or we start feeling like I can figure this out. You know, I I have to be able to do this by myself. And there are so many resources out there with tutoring or therapies and things like that, that can help your child grow and, um, and still be a part of their, their educational growth and journeys. So Just being able to kind of shift our mindset on that too. Yeah. If you look at it like a cost time analysis (laughs) of what it's going to take you to get to the point where you can actually teach your child. I mean, I even know some parents who have gotten full degrees just to help their child with reading. And, um, and, you know, maybe that was their calling. Well, it definitely wasn't mine, but, (laughs) um, but yet you know, there, there is an investment either way. And, Mm -hmm. and so, um, so really, you know, prayerfully consider all of those things and, and yes, it, it, it's becoming more and more um, accepted by homeschooling parents. I think as homeschooling has become more mainstream that using those resources is important, but I think we still do have that struggle. Like you were talking about Veronica is I should be able to do it all myself. And Mm -hmm just can't. And, um, and maybe sometimes we just shouldn't <laughs> <That's> <laughs> true. learning and really loving that subject. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So, um, yeah. What so, was the second part of that question? I know there was a little more in there. Did I address that? I'm not sure. Um, let's see. I can, I remember what the second part of the question was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I shouldn't have asked two at the same time, but, um, I think it was, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. I'll have to maybe come back to that. I know we okay. had some questions from some viewers and okay. so I'm going to bring those into the conversation. Mm-hmm. And if you're watching live, I know we have some viewers on, on live with us and you have any questions as well. Um, make sure you put those in the feed. We'd love to include those as well in our conversation. So, um, so we had one parent, Marie, um, asked my son has slow processing with inattentive ADHD. Um, how can he squeeze more? T- how can we squeeze in more time for fun courses? So I think, yeah, well, I'll just leave that with you. <laughs> okay. So a couple of things come to mind. Um, first thing I see with the ADD is establishing that environment for success. Those um, whatever tools that child needs for success, whether that's supplementation or diet or whatever needs to happen to right. just help them. Get, into, get to a place to be more successful. And sometimes that's a quiet environment for that child set aside. Um, in our homeschool, we are dealing with some of that too. And so it's knowing that or as a group, then we have to break off sometimes because right. they need yeah. that quiet to focus and, and rebalance and so forth. So when you take that time to create that environment, then it can happen more quickly than if you're just pushing through in the midst of chaos and everything's the dogs barking and everything else you're trying to get through. It's going to take forever. And so um, it's kind of using your time wisely, first of all, creating that environment. And then I see that where like the fun courses and really looking at what are the not fun courses and how can you make them fun instead? Oh, yeah. How can you add in the fun within it versus adding on top of it? Right. And so that's kind of, you know, making a game out of something or having them jump up and down when you're quizzing them on certain math facts or 
Um, you know, just adding in whatever that child needs that will help them to enjoy that learning process as well. And then also seeing the benefit in things like playing games and so forth. We've gone through, um, one of my children has gone through like brain therapy and a lot of the recommendation was just playing board games. And it's something that just wow. seems so simple. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's what we do outside of school, but right. yet it builds that co- those cognitive functioning skills and executive functioning skills that they need to be able to do their school well. And so yes. maybe incorporating that as well throughout the homeschool day or a couple of times a week to just build those processing skills to help them with their courses as well. So just some ideas and thoughts on that. I'm yeah, sure. that's, those are great ideas. I know I'd, I had a guest about a month ago who also talked about board games as being good for social skills mm, and yes. how you take turns and, mm-hmm. you know, you have to wait for that person and, and sometimes there'll be disappointments and you have yes. to deal with that. And <laughs> yeah, you have to learn how to lose. <laughs> right. like, congratulations right. anyway. Uh-huh. Job, Absolutely. But... There's just so many things. To, and, and so, yes, we sometimes, again, it goes back to that play um, mm-hmm. and, and just learning to be playful as an adult and to embrace that play as part of learning too, because as parents and I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Veronica, I was raised mm-hmm. in the, the typical school system and learning wasn't happening unless you were sitting at a desk, you know, mm-hmm. and it took so long to break that mold for me. Um, and so I do think we do often as, as this mom said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to squeeze in the, the fun mm-hmm. and, and yet oftentimes we, we miss, that the fun is part of the learning as well. And, and so, yeah, that's great advice. I love it. And, and allowing your kids to, to maybe add some new board games into your life. I know our kids have added some that I'm like, really? <laughs> that does not look like fun at all. Um, but, but it, it has, we have learned to embrace them because it, it focuses around their interests. And, and sometimes too, just finding that balance because, you know, there are times when it's not fun and that's a reality too. And so, you know, we, we talk about that and there's times that we have to do things that yeah. are challenging, but that's how we're going to grow. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. finding the fun in that could be bringing in, sometimes we'll bring in gel pens that just add a little sparkle to the work or, yes. <laughs> you know, fun could be a, a cup of tea and, you know, things like that, that just create that atmosphere for learning. But, yes. and those opportunities to say, you know, when I'm stuck, how can I push through even when it's not fun or entertaining, because that's a skill that our children need to learn as well. So it's finding that balance in the two, I think is important. Yeah, it really is. And, and knowing, you know, when, how much you can push. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's all just learning too, with your kids, because each of them are so different. I I know, I'm sure for your kids, there was probably some that could make it a little bit longer with that challenge and some that would just break down and and start crying. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. it really wasn't worth pushing that hard. (laughs) Yeah. So, so yes. So, so Marie, I hope that, um, that helps you to, to, with your question and, um, and helping with you, with teaching your son. Um, Paula also had a question. She asked, um, how do you prioritize what to teach when your child has issues processing information? So that goes back to that, the vision that we created along with our buckets. And so, you know, I go back to what our buckets are and what we have found to be most important and then prioritizing that based on what they're able to do and capable of doing at that time. Um, There have been times when we have to put aside science, for example, or history to focus on those life skills or those processing skills. And once those get developed and get going, then we can slowly add in some of those other pieces. And so we're prioritizing based on their needs, but also based on what we have established to be of utmost importance. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how we've navigated it throughout the years. Um, Sometimes we're heavier on the history part. Sometimes it just kind of depends on where we are. And sometimes we'll take a curriculum and we'll make it last a year and a half so that we get to enjoy that process. And the kids are doing well with it. They're learning a ton. We're doing geography in there. We're doing music. We're doing art. So why not throw that in too? So um, it goes back to the unique needs of the children and where they are and then our goals as well. 
And that's going to vary from family to family and child to child. Even Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm working on with one child, sometimes in the basics with reading, writing, math, and thinking is different than another child. And it just depends on where they are, but always being that one step ahead of them. Okay. They've accomplished this. What's the next thing that they need to be able to do. And um, I know for those foundational skills, the reading, the writing, the math, you know, those are things that build on one another. And Mm -hmm. so the priority would just be taking them where they are and taking that to the next step. And, you know, as I sat down, because I did work in ELAR, so English Language Arts and Reading, um, Mm -hmm. when I was a consultant and so forth, being able to step back and take that process of reading and just break that down into steps or even like grammar and mechanics, you see that it's not a whole lot. um, Mm -hmm. But it's something that needs to be done when the child is ready a lot of times when they're yes. developmentally ready. And so sometimes we try to push those things when they're too young or they're not ready for it. And then it takes a lot longer than if we just took a little break and then reintroduced right. it later and then they can just kind of go through it more quickly. So it's, it's again, watching your child and just prioritizing their growth in each of those buckets, wherever they are. Yeah. So, and I think it goes back to what you were originally talking about when we first started was that fear. Yes, yes. That fear will push us to say, well, if I just work a little bit more, or if I just found another curriculum, or if I, yes, yes. how, how have you dealt with that? And, and knowing, you know, yes, these are the next steps, or yes, I need to take a break, but I can't give into this fear and allow it to push me. At first I didn't. So at first I bought every curriculum I could find because they all promised such I great know. results. Yes, and exactly. For a lot of kids, it probably did just what it said it would do. But right. for some of my kids, it, it didn't. And that's where I had to go back to. It was a tool. And so if we're working on our math facts, for example, our addition facts, and we went through this curriculum and we checked off the boxes, but we got to the end and the child still didn't know their math facts, then I couldn't just go on to the next one until I knew they had that piece. So my priority at that moment would be like, let's work on this for a little bit. And so that could be a $5 workbook from the grocery store that has those practices built in. It could be flashcards. It could be, you know, different games that we play or online games. There's some little math games online that they could play every day for 10 minutes. And then we could keep going with our curriculum when they're ready. And then they just supplement here for 10 minutes a day. So it just depended on um, what they needed at that particular time. But as I started to see that bigger picture and as I started to flesh it out in my bucket planner, I was like, okay, these are the things we need to do. How we get there doesn't matter as long as we get there and we're working toward that. Um, And that's, you know, we look at something like grammar and the parts of speech, there are eight of them. And yet some curriculum companies are doing it from first grade, second grade, every single year, all eight. I remember going back well, let me back up here. So if I'm a, I'm a homeschool parent and I'm teaching third grade and I'm picking up this particular curriculum, I'm going to be overwhelmed because my child's not where they need to be. And I might feel right. that fear and, oh my goodness, you know, now we're behind and so forth. <laughs> but when I taught my middle school, I had so many students who would walk into seventh grade and not know what a noun was. And we just started at the beginning at the end of the year. And we went through, we got through all eight and then some by the end of the year and they did just fine. And so I had to start looking at, does it matter if they get it in third grade or can they get it a little later? And as long as they learn those eight parts of speech, as long as they learn those capitalization rules, as long as they're getting it, seeing that big picture and we're working toward it, then that's what's more important than, again, checking off that box and sticking with that one curriculum that may not be the best fit for that child. So it it took a while to kind of step back and rethink those goals. I, like I said, I fleshed them all out in that bucket planner. Um, It's a part of that system if anybody wants that broken down bit by bit piece. But for the most part, it's just seeing what those goals are. You know, you go to history as an example, and there's American history and there's world history. And 
how you do that is up to right. you, depending on what country you're in. It could be different, of course, but right. how you do that is up to you. And if you talk to one curriculum company, they say you have to do world history in four years. And then you talk to another one, they say you have to do it in three years. And then you go right. to another one and they say you could do it in one year. So it, it varies. Everybody has their own way of doing it. Absolutely. And if your goal is, I just have to do world history, then that's when the freedom comes in. Of, okay. How do you want to get there? How do you want to do yeah. that? So Yeah. There is so much freedom in that. And, and again, it goes back to what you were talking about before is that the curriculum doesn't, is not the dictator. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you have that ability to choose and use and, and customize and, and just use the curriculum for what it was for. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. curriculum writers love them, you know, Mm -hmm. they, they put so much research into what they do and plan it out and it saves us a lot of time, (laughs) Yes, but it can also create a lot of fear in us which is what we were just talking about too, if we think that we have to stay on their timeline. And mm-hmm. so, so I love that you're talking about both, both sides of that. We do have one question that really mm-hmm. pertains to that. And um, Jacqueline asked, mm-hmm. how can I combat the overwhelm with the amount of resources that are out there? It has, it's, there's so many. I just, I, I started homeschooling almost 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot then. There was no overwhelm. There was, where do I find stuff that I can use? Um, <laughs> Um, and it's wow. amazing just in, in those two decades, what has happened in our industry and, and that parents are overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. So, so what advice do you have for, for Jacqueline? I once saw a quote um, that said something like, being overwhelmed is not having too much to do. It's not knowing where to start. Yes. And that resonated with mm-hmm. me a lot because, you know, the overwhelm is just, you see it all everywhere and it's how do I make sense of all this that's right. out there. Um, and so I do have a video. So I don't know if this would be helpful, but it mm-hmm. takes you kind of through that, my bucket planning system and that if you wanted to create your own, you could kind of follow through those videos and maybe that would be helpful, but you could start off with one bucket, for example. And I actually have like a master bucket planner. And so what that means is I have a bucket for discipleship, for example. And anytime I see this great resource out there, I'm on social media and somebody's sharing it before I go buy it. Like I used to, (laughs) I put it in my bucket planner and I just stick it in my master one. And I'm like, it's there because we're already on track. We found what's working for us right now. We're using this and we're okay with this. And I'm not going to go jump from here to there all over the place because that is where a lot of the overwhelm comes into. We want to do it all and we want to do it all at the same time. Exactly. And so that's not going to work. So I kind of put it in this like idea bank, if you will. So if you have yeah. a notebook, you can just create a page for discipleship, another one for science, another one for American history, whatever you buckets you want to create. Yeah. And then just put it away, just jot it down and put it away. And then at the beginning of the following year or the next semester, wherever you take your shift, then you can go back to it and say, okay, I have these five ideas here. What do I want to bring into this year? What can wait a little bit longer? And that is what's helped me just kind of streamline all those ideas and say, Mm -hmm. okay, this is all we're going to work on for this year. And then at the beginning of every term, I just look at that little list and I break it down even further. And that's all I focus on and target. And then at the end of that term, I can see, okay, I accomplished our goals. Now I can move on to the next thing. And so Mm -hmm. that is kind of what's helped me is just um, writing it down somewhere and having it organized so that it's not all in front of me all at the same time. And then I'm feeling like I have to be doing it all also. Right. Yeah, it it is. You you do get that feeling that it's like, well, if this is working for them, then it could be working for me. And I I think Mm -hmm. we, we change that that grass is greener yes, <laughs> you know, yes. scenario all the time. And we forget that we're, we're where we are and what we've been given. And we don't, um, we don't have the gratitude and the, mm-hmm. the mental capacity or even space to enjoy where we are right now and where our child's at and, and just where God led us in this season. So, yes. um, so I, I love that. I think- idea list. I think also the more we try to dump on and the more we try to do, the more we're going to miss those opportunities for connection, those opportunities for conversation, you know, thinking takes time. And I know that 
you know, in my past work with the thinking process, it was often the first thing to go because there was no time. You had to pass these tests. But in homeschooling, we have that time and those opportunities. But unfortunately, we like to dump more things in there because we (laughs) we do have so much time. (laughs) Yeah, we see that empty box and we're like, I have to fill it. And so sometimes I will purposefully leave a bucket empty for that week And look for those opportunities where it's getting naturally filled, whether it's art or creative arts, for example. The kids are constantly creating, and now they're exploring their own. One is sewing, one is crocheting. You know, they're doing Mm -hmm. things, and, you know, it's easy to miss that if you're always trying to do everything else. And so leaving that margin in there, that room for just – having that conversation and just putting a topic up and we're just going to talk about it and seeing that conversation as learning too. That's, that's so yes. important is those conversations and discussions that you have with your kids. Um, I think oftentimes is more valuable than sometimes just a workbook page or something like that. So Absolutely. we have to, again, shift our thinking a little bit along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And make time for that. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Yeah. Um, we had one other question and I, I think we've, we've kind of covered it in the process of, of the rest of our talking, but we had one other um, person submit questions, which you can submit uh, questions to us, by the way. So if you're on our, um, our newsletter email list, then you'll get an, uh, an email the night before we do a broadcast. And it has a link in there that allows you to submit your questions and get a reminder that the show is starting. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a win-win for you um, mm-hmm. because if you can't watch on time, you can either watch the, the broadcast afterwards on YouTube or Facebook, um, or you can listen to the podcast a couple of weeks later and your question will be answered. So how cool mm-hmm. is that? Um, but also if you are available and you just need an extra reminder, which <laughs> I have reminders <laughs> on my phone to eat. So <laughs> you can imagine I, I have, I need lots of reminders. Um, but, um, but we'll send you one of those too. It's just a quick email. Um, just small, little text. It's not, it doesn't even have graphics in it. It's just the show is starting. Here's the link. <laughs> and, and it's super easy for you. Um, so, so take advantage of that. We know your lives are busy and um, we just, we want to be able to be here for you and to have our guests be able to address the questions that are most important to you. So, um, so yeah. So Veronica, I would love as we're kind of wrapping this up mm-hmm. to, um, to share about your resources and your website so that um, our viewers can connect with you. Sure. So my website is nurturingconnectionshomeschool.com. And on there, I have a bunch of blog posts, just different um, encouragement posts as well on there that kind of take you through the journey that I've been on in, in understanding this idea of homeschool freedom with responsibility. Yeah. Um, you know, understanding there's one called if you homeschool your children, there will be gaps in their education. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, just being able to see that, you know, what that means, what that looks like and how we're here to right. educate our children and teach them how to learn so they can fill their own gaps later on. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, so they're encouragement po- or encouraging posts like that. I also have a free printable library on there where there are different, um, resources like a reader's notebook for little ones, a student planner, student planner pages on there. Um, just a number of things based on all the different posts I've shared. And then I do have my YouTube channel where I'm sharing things as well. Um, more of the day to day, what our updates look like, what we're doing, how we're using this bucket planning system. Yeah. And then I do have a shop where I am sharing the, the bucket planner and um, a reading curriculum that I'm working on for little ones because we did have some learning struggles with reading. And so taking my background and what I saw out there, I just saw some of those pieces that needed to be filled in for those kinesthetic learners for, excuse me, I have something in my throat. throat) Sorry. (laughs) Didn't want to clear that there. Um, But, you know, just for the the child that learns differently and um, tapping into that. So I have that available in my shop as well. And I did put a coupon code for anybody listening here, SPED homeschool, get 40% off. So, if that helps a little bit, but I did want to share that. So, okay. Yeah. 
and mm-hmm. and so um, is that all caps or is it just it doesn't lower, matter, lower lower case doesn't matter. okay mm-hmm. all right well that's awesome well thank you so much and thank you for all that you're doing and um, just the resources I know a lot of times you know we, we create things for our kids but the the willingness to be able to share that um, with others is such a blessing and um, just encourage yes, you um, does yeah writing about it it just it, it helps to normalize I think a lot of the things that um, just you know, as we as homeschoolers, especially with struggling students, we go through and we think, I'm all alone. There's nobody else that's going through this. And so for you to write about it and to, you know, to have a YouTube channel where you talk about it, um, just that we hear over and over from parents saying, just we, we love hearing the stories that, you know, people have been there, they've done that, I can do this too. Um, and, and so just want to keep encouraging you in that as you, you continue your journey. I know you, you have <laughs> homeschooling years left and you're still learning along the way as you shared with me and, um, and may God just continue to bless you, um, in, you. in all of that. And so, Thank so definitely you. check out um, Veronica's website page. Again, it's Nourishing Connections. Nurturing. Oh, nurturing. NurturingConnectionsHomeschool.com. Um, it's on here. It'll be in the description. There'll be a link and um, for the YouTube channel as well as um, when the podcast goes up, it'll be in that description too, as well as um, direct connections to, I think you gave me links to, let's see, I've got your... Um, homeschool, preschool, kindergarten, how to get started, the bucket planning mm-hmm. system for grades K through um, grade one through 12, and mm-hmm. then a link to your blog as well as your um, reading level A. So mm-hmm. we'll have all of those those links okay. available for you guys just to click right on instead of having to copy down those long URLs. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a long one, sorry. So, so much easier. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Well, thank mm-hmm. you so much, Veronica. This has been sure. just a wonderful conversation. Um, I hope it's been freeing um, to our listeners because I we do get caught. We get caught up in that fear, caught up in that dictatorship of curriculum. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, just to to know that that it can work and it does work and that there's another way um thank you for just opening our eyes to that and, mm-hmm. and being willing to to share that thank you for so, having me absolutely yeah so um we're going to continue talking about twice exceptional learners next week um but we're going to be talking I, I guess veronica talked a little bit about this but um, we're going to be talking about creating um calming spaces in your home mm-hmm. and so um jason hish um is going to join me he has a whole he has a son on the spectrum and um that started him in actually creating sensory products and and so that's what he and his family do now full time. And so mm-hmm. he is very passionate about this topic. And um, so I'm excited to have him on the show and to share with you just on how to create some of those those calming spaces within your home, which I know we all could use, even us as parents. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and so you'll definitely want to join us again um, next week for for that conversation. So. Um, so yeah, so thanks again, Veronica, and um, thank you all for joining us on on the show this week. And um, we'll see you next week here, same time, same place. Um, take care, all, and and God bless, and we'll see you then. Bye, everyone. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on this podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. This has been Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. I'm Don Hawkins, and I once heard Chick-fil-A founder Truett Cathy say, you can tell if a person needs encouragement, check to see if they're breathing. I'd like to invite you to my weekly podcast, Encouragement for You, featuring encouraging guests like Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley, Dan Cathy, the late Dr. Frank Menrith, Josh McDowell, and more. To subscribe to my weekly Encouragement for You podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. That's lifeaudio.com.